it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. <laughs> because I feel that there are some very urgent problems which the world must address. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Build that wall. Build that wall. No, нет никаких доказательств того, что мы. You know, Iran, Russia, Pakistan, India, China. They're all going to do what they have to do to secure their interests. And that's when you have to worry about the risk of proxy war, particularly in terms between Af India and Pakistan. But, um, I imagine that we're far away from the period we were in, you know, in those, uh, those, those salad days, so to speak, of the early 20th century when Afghanistan enjoyed that period of some, some um, stability and prosperity without interference from other countries. I don't think we're going to see those days return for quite some time. Assalamualaikum. This is Aras Khan, and welcome to the sixth episode of Ground Zero. Today we have with us Mr. Michael Kugelman, who is a deputy director and senior associate at the Wilson Center, covering South Asia. In today's episode, we will discuss how a U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan looks like, and what consequences will it have on the region, and specifically for Afghanistan. So, without wasting much time, let's get to Mr. Kugelman and discuss today's issue. Hello, Michael. How are you? Very well, thank you, and I hope you are as well. Yeah, I'm good too. Thank you for being with us on our show. It's such a pleasure to have you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So uh, we are discussing about the uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and what consequences will it have on the region and especially on Afghanistan. So. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you think of what U.S. has gained after 20 years being in Afghanistan? That's a great question. And I think that um, on one level, given how much bad news there is from Afghanistan all the time, uh, on one level, you know, the answer would be, well, I can't really think of anything to say there. But you know, I think it is important to highlight the, the gains that, that really are there. And I think that you would have to look at... Uh, you know, mainly issues of rights, uh, civil liberties, women's rights. I mean, no one, even even the harshest critic of the U.S. or the 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 NATO-led mission in Afghanistan, uh, you know, even even the biggest critics of that mission would have to admit that um, things are a lot better for civil liberties and human rights now than they were when the Taliban was in control and was uh, essentially presiding over a repressive theocracy. Um, so certainly, I think that's significant. So many more women going to school. Uh, so many more women out in public. Uh, you know, freedom of, of speech, uh, the ability of journalists to go out and do their jobs and, and be critical of the government if they wish, you have that opportunity. Um, and I think also looking at, um, you know, small areas of successes in the economy, uh, the Afghan economy is certainly a mess, but I would argue that um, you have had some, some small success stories uh, in the private sector, uh, some successes in diversifying the private uh, sector. These are things that you didn't have uh, pre-2001, but bottom line is that Afghanistan is really in a very precarious state right now, even with these far, this foreign troop mission there for so long. And I have another most anticipated question for you, which is how do you see Joe Biden's presidency for Afghanistan? Because we have seen that during his vice president tenure, he has been, a, he has been very vocal about it and been a very decent voice uh, about the uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. So how do you see his presidency? Well, you know, Biden and, uh, and Trump don't really agree on much at all, but I would argue that Afghanistan is an area, is one of the few areas where there is a lot of convergence. Uh, indeed, um, as you suggested, Biden has never been a, a supporter of an extended U.S. presence in Afghanistan. I really think that he wants to get out uh, just as much as Trump does. Um, as, as you'll recall, when he was vice president, he was one of the only vocal opponents of the Obama troop surge, and he was not, a, he was not bashful about uh, telegraphing that opposition. Um, but I, I think that there are some differences between him and Trump, and the main one re relates to the sequencing and pacing of a withdrawal. Yes, Biden wants to get out, 
But I think it's 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 quite clear based on what he has said in the past, and especially more recently, what his his campaign advisors uh, have said about Afghanistan, and that is that uh, Biden will want to um, uh, have a responsible withdrawal from Afghanistan. The word responsible is the one that, um, for one person, Anthony Blinken, who's now, of course, the nominee for to be Biden Secretary of State, his emphasis on a on a slower, more responsible withdrawal. And I think the idea there is to tie the withdrawal of further U.S. troops to conditions on the ground. And specifically, I imagine that Biden would want to uh, try to be tougher with the Taliban. I imagine that he would want to threaten the Taliban not to conclude, to complete the U.S. withdrawal, uh, unless there's indications that the Taliban is um, not, no longer cooperating with Al Qaeda. Um, Bottom line here is that Biden has always seen Afghanistan through the lens of uh, counterterrorism. Uh, Trump has as well, but Biden even more so. So I think that for Biden, the major focus for him will be figuring out how to maintain a U.S. counterterrorism capacity in Afghanistan, and particularly whether that can be done if you no longer have any troops in the country. That'll be one of the first initial policy challenges for his administration. And you mentioned about a responsible withdrawal. So how... Uh, would you see a responsible withdrawal from Afghanistan? Right. I mean, it's it, it's hard to argue there can be a responsible withdrawal just because, first of all, when Biden takes office, there's only going to be 2,500 troops left. So there's not there's not much more of a withdrawal to undertake. Uh, and either way, I mean, Afghan, the Afghan government and the Afghan people are very unhappy that uh, the U.S. has already been irresponsible in pulling so many troops out of the country without the Taliban giving anything in return. But I think that getting to your question, what would a responsible withdrawal really look like? I think as Biden sees it, as his administration would see it, I think that it would take place only after there are clear indications, not assurances, but clear indications from the Taliban that the insurgents have, um, have reduced violence and especially that they have distanced themselves from Al Qaeda. I mean, those are the, the two key areas that this administration would look at. But at the end of the day, uh, there's going to be limited patience here. I think that for Biden, the ideal goal would to be to pull as many troops out of the country as he can, while still hopefully keeping some on the ground to form the basis of a, of a counterterrorism capacity. But of course, the, the Taliban insists that all U.S. troops have to be out by the end of spring, per its agreement with, with the U.S. But I think that the administration could could argue that the, the its agreement, the agreement that the Trump administration signed with the Taliban stipulated that all U.S. troops will leave the country by the spring of next year only if the Taliban has, has stopped cooperating with Al Qaeda. So it's it's really hard to talk about the notion of a responsible withdrawal just because there's the withdrawal is pretty much all done with so far and it hasn't been very responsible. But I think that the, the bottom line here is that for the administration, a responsible withdrawal would be one that is tied to conditions on the ground. So uh, I have to quote one thing uh, which is, in November, Acting Defense Secretary Christopher Miller, he announced that by January 15th, U.S. will uh, get it to 2,500 troops out of Afghanistan. So don't you think it will create the same vacuum in Afghanistan which was created in Iraq? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, that number, the U.S. will have uh, fewer troops in Afghanistan than it's had uh, many, many years, I believe, since 2002. But I think you could argue that, um, yes, it will create a vacuum to pull so many troops out there, but you still could have uh, benefits, I think, of, of having even that small number there. And I'm not, I'm not trying to argue for a long-standing uh, presence of 2,500 troops, but if you have even a few thousand troops there, you know, there, you, that, will be a, that will form a capacity to continue, even if in modest terms, this long-time training and advising mission for Afghan forces, which is so essential. And it will also allow the U.S. to work with Afghan forces to deal with the, uh, with the broader terrorism problem, the problem posed by ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda. And I think the biggest advantage of keeping those 2,500 there, even if it's such a small amount, is that it'll be a psychological boost to an Afghan state and an Afghan society that really worries that it's just a matter of time before the U.S. abandons Afghanistan to its fate, just like it did some decades back. Um, so 
I, I think that it would be accurate to say that there will be a vacuum that's created, but it won't be a complete vacuum just because there will be some, I think, some tactical, some operational and certainly psychological benefits that, that accrue on the whole by maintaining that small force. So uh, I'm quoting you here. Uh, you have mentioned uh, in one of your statement that it's a landmark deal and the uh, Akwan, different Akwan groups have to be on the same page to embrace it and to have a peace process in Afghanistan. So, but do you think uh, Taliban who are anti-democracy, they can be on the same uh, platform on which Afghan government is? I think it's it's a, it's a bit of a tall order, uh, to be sure. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. Taliban deal was indeed a landmark agreement just because nothing like it had ever been signed before. And it really put the put Afghanistan in a position where it was closer to launching a peace process than at any time before during the course of this, this nearly 20-year U.S.-led war. But absolutely, I think that we should have no illusions that the idea of a successful peace process um, is, 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 is it's, it's, that's a tall order uh, in of itself. And it's true that, you know, you have the two sides coming to the negotiating table, the Afghan state and the Taliban. Not only do they disagree on, you know, things like what should be at the top of the agenda, what should be discussed first, those are still has to be worked out. But more, there's much deeper fundamental disagreements about worldviews, which is what I think you were suggesting. The Taliban has never indicated that it's interested in, in democracy or constitutional democracy. It's never indicated that it would, or it's never guaranteed that it would not want to bring back the system that it had in the late 1990s. Whereas of course the Afghan government, say what you will about it, but this is a government that has pledged to, to support the Afghan constitution, which promotes democracy. And the question is, given those wide, huge divides between the two sides, is there ever any way that they could reach a, you know, some, some sort of middle ground? And for that to happen, you're gonna to need to have a lot of compromises. And I fear that the Taliban would not be willing to make compromises simply because it hasn't had to. It's had the upper hand in this peace and reconciliation process from the start and knows that the US is on its way out. It can just wait the US out before it focuses its full attention on the fight. And I, don't, I think the Taliban has the luxury of not needing to make compromises, which is not a good thing if you want this peace process to succeed. So what do you think about U.S. dealing with Taliban on a different uh, platform uh, where there is no one government involved in that process? So uh, that means Taliban are dealing with the U.S. administration and with Afghan administration on different platforms. So do you think uh, it will create uncertainty in the process? Well, this is, this is a great question. I mean, already the fact that you had the US and the Taliban um, engaged in bilateral negotiations, that's already caused a lot of problems for the broader peace process. And it's ironic because the only way that we were going to get a peace process to begin um, between the Afghan government and the, the Taliban was of course to have those exclusive bilateral negotiations between the Taliban and the US because the Taliban had, had said that it, it, it said it would never, it would never sit across the table with the, with, with the Afghan government until it has a chance to sit across the table only with the US to work out a troop withdrawal deal. And it's interesting that you know, the, the, the Trump administration was the first US administration that agreed to that Taliban demand to sit down only with, uh, with the Taliban without Kabul in the room. There were many uh, opportunities in the past, including during the Obama administration to, uh, to launch a formal peace process, but Obama had refused to sit down bilaterally exclusively the, with the Taliban and insisted that Kabul be there, which the Afghan Taliban has said no to. At any rate, um, that now we're in a, a tough spot because the Afghan government has found itself in a position where it's being asked to make concessions uh, to the Taliban that had been negotiated in an earlier uh, negotiation where it was not involved, and particularly the issue of releasing all these Taliban prisoners. That's been very tough for the Afghan government. That was a component of the U.S.-Taliban deal where the U.S. basically committed the Afghan government to release all these Taliban uh, captives back to the Taliban, you know, that's significant leverage uh, that gives, the, that gives the, the Afghan government a lot of bargaining chips, having all those Taliban captives, but basically it was put in a position where it had to release them. And I think there's still a lot of unhappiness and tensions between the U.S. and the Afghan governments because of that. And now, of course, the Taliban has said that it, the, its intra-Afghan dialogue with, with the Afghan state 
has to use that US Taliban deal as a basis. And indeed, there's another disconnect right there. That basically means, and the Afghan government has now agreed to this, that this intra-Afghan dialogue will be on the basis of the, um, the US Taliban deal. That means that everything that comes out of this very fraught negotiation is going to have to go back to what was negotiated earlier in a context where Kabul was not present. Very, very difficult state of play. And I think this is one reason why the Afghan government is hoping, um, I think in a misplaced fashion, I think, hoping that the Biden administration will come in and try to shake things up and maybe try to abrogate the US Taliban deal and that was concluded with the Trump administration and try to start over. I don't think the Biden administration is gonna do that though. And what specifically do you think Taliban wants right now? Uh, do they want to continue this peace field or they want a complete rule over Afghanistan? Well, you know, this is the million dollar question that uh, no one really has an answer to. And certainly you've got uh, some, um, there's one camp that will argue, well, the Taliban that we see today is very different from the Taliban of the, uh, the late 1990s. You've got a younger generation, a more moderate generation of Taliban leaders that realized that what they did in the late 1990s was wrong and can never be done again. And that they really are genuinely interested in sharing power within some type of uh, post-conflict uh, uh, arrangement. They're willing to give up their arms. They're willing to treat women better and so on and so forth. But there's another camp that argues, well, there's no reason to think that that's the case just because the Taliban has not actually come out and said that they're going to do things differently. I think it's notable that the Taliban has always been very vague in its statements about what it wants and what it would want an Af Afghanistan to look like after uh, after negotiation in which it would have some sort of role. All it will say is that um, you know things will be done while upholding uh, Islamic law, but it's, it's very vague about that. It, it also uses that, that rubric to describe what would uh, be the, the plight of, of, of Afghan women. They'll be treated in accordance with Islamic law. Obviously that could be interpreted in many, many um, different ways. In my own view, to be quite frank and to be quite cynical, is that uh, you know, the Taliban has, has long wanted to control the country uh, on, on the whole. I don't really think that that view has changed. It's a maximalist organization in that regard. So that suggests to me that when, if it just waits some more time until most if not US troops are gone, it could return to the fight, focus its full attention on that and see what happens. And you know, I think that um, once you have, once US troops are out of the country, once you have a very tiny, small number, that's going to make it a lot easier for the Taliban to be able to challenge urban areas where it hasn't had much success, just because typically the US would be very helpful in that regard when the Taliban would make, uh, would try to uh, seize urban uh, territory, Afghan forces would call in US um, uh, airstrikes to repel the Taliban before they actually got into the cities. Well, without the US forces there, that's not gonna happen. So this suggests to me that, um, you know, the Taliban may just be able to sort of see things fall in place in a way that it would like to. It will be able to take over more territory, including in cities. And once it's taking over cities, it's going to be in a better position to threaten to take full power on the whole. And unfortunately, that's that's something that we would have to uh, have to worry about. And I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not optimistic about this idea of the Taliban suddenly deciding to share power with the people that it rejects and within a system that it also rejects. Mm. And I'm very curious to know that who do you think is supporting Taliban throughout this war? Because obviously, you know, it needs money and support to continue a war. So who do you think is behind them? Well, I think the Taliban has been fortunate that it's been able to diversify its sources of support, both financial and support and other types of support. Uh, certainly, it, uh, it, it gets a lot of support from the Afghan. I mean, that's an important thing to remember right here. And I'm talking about other, other Afghans. I mean, it's been able to recruit continuously to its cause, even though it's lost so many, uh, so many fighters on the battlefield. And you know, certainly there are those that indicate that, well, you just, the, the, the Taliban just goes across the border to Pakistan to recruit troops to its cause. Now that may be the case to, to some extent, but this is an Afghan insurgency and it is fueled by local grievances and on many levels. So. It's, you know, it's got plenty of support from, from Afghans themselves. But in terms of external support, certainly you know, the fact that his leadership has been able to count on shelters in, Af in Pakistan for so long, that's significant. 
Uh, there's a fair amount of evidence that in more recent years that Iran has provided some levels, and not huge amounts, but some levels of, of, of military support, particularly to Taliban in Western Afghanistan near the Iran border. Uh, I disagree with US officials that claim that Russia had provided military support to the, uh, to the uh, Taliban. I don't think there's enough evidence of that. Um, you know, finances, the Saudis, I think that some of the Gulf states have, have provided financial support to the Taliban over the years. But you know, in terms of financial support, the Taliban has been very um, fortunate to be able to uh, have a number of sources of support within the country, and particularly th through the drug trade, uh, derives a lot of support from, from, from poppy production and all of that. That's, that's very helpful. And it also depends on uh, other illicit industries, like the timber industry, for example. So what this tells me is that uh, the Taliban has the luxury of uh, depending on a wide variety of financial support, both in the country and outside the country. And that's why this is an organization that uh, is in a, unfortunately is in a very good state financially, to the point that some people describe it as more of a, a criminal, like a, like a syndicate. It's like a, like a, um, a financial uh, crime syndicate more than anything else because it's so involved in the drug trade and other illicit industries. But of course, they also are doing really well as, a, as an insurgent group too. Why did the US fail to provide a definite solution in Afghanistan till date? Well, yeah, that's that. You could have a whole separate conversation on that. Uh, there's so many reasons why this U.S. mission went wrong. I think the main one, though, is that um, there there never was a clear strategy. Uh, the U.S. really lacked a clear strategy. NATO clearly la lacked a clear strategy ever since the initial goals of the um, of the war were achieved very early on in the war. Right? We know that. Uh, you know, the U.S. and its allies went into Afghanistan in order to uh, eliminate the Al Qaeda sanctuaries and to um, remove their Taliban host from power when the Taliban refused to give up the uh, bin Laden and other top Al Qaeda leaders. But after those, and the, you know, the Al Qaeda sanctuaries there were, were knocked out pretty early on in the war, and then the Taliban was overthrown just you know within a few weeks, a few months after U.S. forces entered. And then there was a then you there was this moment where. You know, the, the U.S. could have decided, OK, we've achieved our main objectives. Why not leave? And over the course of U.S. foreign policy, there have been many proponents of this idea of go in, do what you have to do with this use of military force. Once you've achieved those initial goals, get out right away. But you had a, a, a situation of mission creep, right, where there was never any any clear um, strategy that was articulated so that, uh, you know, you could never, there was never an administration that could say, okay, well, we're here to, you know, to build democracy. Uh, we're here to only to kill terrorists. We're here to support women's rights. None of these things were ever identified as the clear strategy. Only during the Trump administration uh, was there finally this effort to focus on one particular objective, and that was and that was counterterrorism. But that's, I think the lack of a strategy is the main thing. But obviously there are, there are other factors too, just a lot of people making the decisions in Washington that really didn't understand Afghanistan and its history, uh, underestimating the clout and the strength of the Taliban, not being in a position to figure out how to deal with the uh, the, the longstanding issue of the, the shelters, the, the leadership shelters in Pakistan, uh, not being able to develop some type of regional strategy uh, to figure out the problem. I could go on and on, but uh, the, the answer to your question is the U.S. failed because it just made a lot of, a lot of mistakes. And as you mentioned about building democracy, uh, so let's discuss how do you think uh, the U.S. attempt of building democracy in Afghanistan? Because, you know, Afghanistan has a different uh, social system. It has different value systems. So do you think it could, it could ever embrace democracy? Well, it's true. I mean, it's almost like a cliche at this point that, uh, you know, it's, it's just wrong for, you know, a country like the U.S. and Western allies to go in and try to build a type of democracy that has never existed in Afghanistan and could never exist again. Uh, you know, this is, this is certainly true. And we hear about the idea that Afghanistan, it's, uh, you know, it's defined by, by tribalism, by decentralization, and it doesn't really, has never really placed the premium on central institutions and all of that until the U.S. came in. Uh, and that's, and that certainly is, is all very true. But what's, what's notable is that there was a time when the U.S. seemed to want to try to support democratic progress in Afghanistan in ways that would really mirror what's happened in the U.S. and other Western democracies, almost like 
this notion of creating an Afghanistan in the image of, of the United States. And the U.S. has done this uh, over history in many cases, uh, from, from, from the Iraq more recently to the Philippines, many, many years ago when the U.S. occupied that, that area and tried to rebuild it into something looking like the United States. Obviously, it, you know, it, just, it just cannot work. Uh, it never has and it never will. But yeah, I would argue that that was never really, I don't think that was ever really a major goal um, of, of any administration, even if there was this idea of trying to stay there and, and, and help build, create more freedoms and things like that. I, I don't think that was ever really a major strategy, uh, which, is, which is certainly a good thing because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have succeeded. But now to answer your question, they're, they're to, to, two totally different um, countries. There was no way that you could have tried, had, had a situation where you could say that, well, we're going to build Afghanistan to look like the United States. So this would have, if you wanted to do that, you know, you'd need to do a lot of very different types of things in Afghanistan than the US or its NATO partners were willing to do. And you have mentioned about uh, US presence in Iraq and Philippines. So uh, what do you think about US uh, toppling, uh, US attempt of toppling regimes and invading countries like, don't you think these are these are very offensive measures which uh, led to political vacuum and uncertainty in the region and which, uh, you know, harbors terrorism and result? Yeah, well, there's a there's a saying about U.S. foreign policy or about the U.S. that the U.S. is very good at starting wars, but it's not very good at ending them, uh, which I think is which I think is quite is quite accurate. Um, and it's true, you know, I mean, I, th I think the Iraq war was was different. I mean, that was a unique failure uh, in US history just because it was so clearly wrong. And it was, you know, it was the, the, the war itself was launched on the premise of incorrect information that Iraq had uh, weapons of mass destruction and so on. And indeed, I mean, that war did create the conditions that led to the establishment of, of the Islamic State terror group. Um, I think that's important to keep to keep in mind. The US did not create create Islamic State itself, but what it did in, in Iraq led to a situation coupled with bad U.S. policy that um, led to the emergence of this of this group. But you know, w with Afghanistan, I think it's different. That um, perceptions of the war were very different um, in the early years of it. And you know, I remember being in D.C. and uh, you know, being in a place that was affected by the 9/11 attacks. And I remember that everyone, you know, it, there was so much bipartisan support. There was only a small trickle of, 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 of folks on Capitol Hill and elsewhere that did not think it was right to go into Afghanistan. It was depicted as, as the right war, as the noble war, as the necessary war. Um, so things were very different back then. Obviously, you know, the U.S. being traumatized by what was the, the by far the worst uh, terrorist attack on its soil. And um, the U.S. being the, the superpower it was and U.S. exceptionalism being the thing that it, it was, the idea was there was no other choice but to go in and seek revenge, well not seek revenge, that was part of it, but the idea was to retaliate to ensure that uh, Al-Qaeda would, no would never be able to do something like this again. Um, it was only later on when the war became very unpopular and it, it picked up more negative nicknames like the, you know, the Forgotten War, the, uh, the Invisible War, the Forever War, and so on and so forth. But certainly, I think that it's wrong. I think the days are over. I, I think it's wrong for the U.S. to be launching preemptive wars. Um, and I think that those days are over. I do think the, the Biden administration, like the Trump administration that preceded, didn't really have an interest in that type of thing. Um, and you, know, you could argue that um, you know the, the the Clinton administration, which came to office right after the Cold War ended, that was a time when there was all this focus on democracy promotion and uh, you know humanitarianism, and there was this idea that maybe sometimes the use of military force is justified if what you're going to do is meant to promote democracy and put countries in a position where human rights will be respected more. With the Bush administration, the, the, the reasoning was a lot different. This notion of preemptive war was just like, well, we're, we'll, we'll go in there, do what we have to do and think about the consequences later. Uh, luckily, we don't have that anymore. The Trump administration took a very different direction. And I do expect the Biden administration to be very, to be very have foreign policy goals that are very focused on other things. And I know that there are some, particularly in Pakistan, that think that the, the Obama administration was all about starting wars and intensifying the drone war and all of that. It's not going to be like that with Biden. I really think he'll be focused on other things. And uh, how do you 
think U.S. contribution in rebuilding Afghanistan will it be a part of their foreign policy in upcoming years? Well, you know, if um, if the U.S. military presence uh, recedes uh, or disappears in Afghanistan, I think it would be very difficult for there to be any type of physical American presence on the ground uh, in terms of civilian development uh, presence. I think that it would really the, the U.S. government would not be comfortable committing U.S. nationals to a country that would likely be in a really bad security state, unless by some miracle there's a successful peace process. So, you know, I think that um, once U.S. troops leave, the rest will follow. I imagine that the, uh, the civilian presence, uh, the development presence will, will recede um, as well, so long as there's not an agreement. Obviously, if there, if there is a peace deal, then that changes everything for sure. Uh, and I wouldn't overstate this possibility, but if Afghanistan does become a more stable place, then certainly I think that, you know, you would see efforts on the part of the, uh, of the US government to try to continue to engage, uh, even if it doesn't have much of a presence there. I mean, it's, it's very notable that the, this new US development agency, the Development Finance Corporation, um, met with Taliban leaders. The head of the DFC met with Taliban leaders a few months ago, which some people thought was weird and why should that be happening? But I think the idea there, of course, this was the Trump administration, the idea was that, well, there is a potential to look at a future U.S. financing development uh, role in Afghanistan if you have a peace deal where the Taliban is in power. But, you know, if, if there's no peace deal, if Afghanistan falls apart, and certainly if the Taliban seizes power by force, there's not going to be any type of U.S. support or contribution to Afghanistan. Uh, what if uh, that after U.S. withdrawal, Afghanistan still be a safe haven for terrorists? So what different could you do about that? Oh, so you're talking about the issue of uh, Afghanistan as a terrorist safe haven, right? Yeah. Um, well, you know, this gets to what I had said earlier about uh, a core priority of the, of the Biden administration being how to maintain a counterterrorism uh, capacity. I think that the administration um, is concerned about the fact that Al Qaeda is still there, and it's concerned that the Islamic State is a resilient uh, threat. I actually think that officials on both sides of the political aisle in the U.S. may overstate the threat posed by international terrorism in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is a shadow of its former self. And yes, I mean, it can depend on support from more powerful groups like the Taliban and others, but it's, it's not in a position to, to mount, to plot and mount a major terrorist attack uh, on the United States, much less even anywhere in the broader region. And Islamic State is there. I think we have to really be worried about it because it's been hit so hard for so long and yet it's still there carrying out attacks. But does it have the capacity to, um, to plot an attack on, on the United States? I'm not sure it does. And this, this is what concerns the US the most. I and mean, I think the US would not be as concerned, unfortunately, about ISIS having the capacity to continue carrying out attacks in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or more broadly in the region. It's really the concern for the US is that US interest overseas or the US homeland, so to speak, uh, would be threatened by ISIS attacks. And I don't think any of the, the terror groups in Afghanistan have that capacity. That said, what will the US do? I, I think that, um, as I said earlier, the Biden administration will, would like, it would want to try to, to work out something with the Taliban where it could maintain a small presence of, of troops in Afghanistan to, to be there to go after ISIS and Al-Qaeda. If that fails, I think the next step for the U.S. would be to um, figure out uh, how it could maintain that capacity, that counterterrorism capacity, without soldiers uh, in, in Afghanistan. And that would require some very tricky, delicate diplomacy with the region, such as talking to countries in Central Asia about basing some troops there at a base there. Um, but a lot of those countries in Central Asia have laws that forbid the, uh, the basing of, of foreign troops on their soil. Uh, I don't think that it's uh, at all a, a feasibility that the U.S. could use Pakistan as assistance for this type of thing. I think that you and I would agree that the politics of, of, of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship make that a non-starter. Um, uh, and then you could think about the possibility of, of, of the administration trying to base some troops in, in the Gulf somewhere there, but that's pretty far away from Afghanistan. So, so it's going to be very difficult uh, for this administration to figure out how to maintain that capacity once its, once its troop contingent has, um, has left the country. Okay.
and as you mentioned about pakistan so uh, in november prime minister imran khan offered his country services uh, to us in mediating the talks between taliban and us administration so how do you uh, see pakistan's role in that well i mean clearly it's had it's had a role which the, the us has supported uh, ever since this broader peace and reconciliation process started i think that you know pakistan's job as i understand it is um to try to use its leverage over the Taliban to get the Taliban to be more receptive to these these goals or really should i say these priorities that the Afghan government and the US government and other key countries have and i think that the idea is to, to try to to get the pakistanis to to push the Taliban to agree to reduce violence and to reduce cooperation with al qaeda now i know that in pakistan the 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 officials would say that pakistan's uh, doesn't really have as much leverage as some they think and it may have limited success in that regard i would agree with that um not just because the taliban has the leverage you know we hear about the, the term leverage the taliban has the leverage and i think that even if a country like pakistan which has provided support to the taliban over the years even if pakistan is trying to get the the taliban to agree to something the taliban doesn't have a need to to heed these demands because as i said before you know the taliban knows that if um if if it doesn't if if it's being asked to do things that it doesn't want to do it can just forget about the negotiations altogether i mean it would not be disadvantaged at all if the peace process falls apart it could just focus its attention fully on the fight but that said um i do think that pakistan's role is important um and i think it's significant that you had imran khan visit Kabul not too long ago i think it is very important for there to be continued efforts on the part of pakistan to improve its relationship with the afghan government uh, simply because you need those two countries getting along better um if pakistan is to have any type of facilitator role in this intra-afghan dialogue and we know there's a history of mistrust between afghanistan and pakistan so i think it's great that 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 you had that that visit by khan that you had that joint statement that laid out all these areas of cooperation a lot of it was perhaps overly ambitious but um you know, i think it's it's so much important if, if you want this peace process to succeed a lot of things have to happen but one thing that you need is that you need to have relations that are good enough between kabul and islamabad so that kabul will not try to push away the pakistanis if the pakistanis are trying to you know work with the taliban or work with others to to move the process along and i know that the us government um the biden administration would would want pakistan to have a continued role and i imagine that that washington would try to impress that that message upon upon kabul uh, as well but at the end of the day there's only so much any country including pakistan can do uh in terms of its role in this peace process because the taliban unfortunately has all the cards it's got the upper hand it's got the leverage it doesn't have to listen to anyone if it doesn't want to so let me ask you how would a taliban government will be for pakistan because in the past we have seen pakistan has a strategic depth in afghanistan so will it facilitate that also uh well i mean if there were to be a taliban government uh obviously it it depends on what leads up to that to that process i think the best case scenario which is also i think the most unlikely scenario is that you have a peace process that that culminates in a settlement in which you have a um a coalition government so to speak in which the taliban uh has a role in the government but with others with other political stakeholders in afghanistan as well and you would look for that type of government to be one that upholds at least some of uh Afghanistan's current uh, constitution with 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 some semblance of um of democracy respect for women's rights and and so on you know obviously the other possibility and there are many but another possibility is one in which the Taliban or seizes power by force uh and in that case it obviously could do whatever it wanted to do and that's when you would have to worry about something like what it had in the um in in the late 90s honestly i think very few people know what's going to happen what the taliban wants as i indicated earlier i do fear that it it, it hopes to just pick up the fight on the battlefield and seize power and so that it can be in a position to do what it wants uh you know the taliban i think that if it if it would want to take seriously the idea of governance and ruling the country it would have to look at the issue of international diplomacy and foreign assistance as something critical i mean yes the taliban has a lot of money uh 
but not enough money to cover the bill for, for Afghanistan on the whole, if it were to be in power. So that suggests perhaps a desire to be moderate so that it could work with, with other countries. But as I said, if it seizes power by force, it's not going to get support from anyone, quite frankly, except for perhaps Pakistan and a few and a few other players. So I think that that would not that would not work well. Um, but uh, you know, it's interesting that you talk about the issue of Pakistan and and the Taliban. I would argue that um, you know the, Pakistan would be very happy uh, if there were to be a successful peace process in which the Taliban would have a role in a in a political government with Afghanistan at peace. That would work very well for Islamabad, just because it has always wanted a government in Afghanistan that's friendly to Pakistan. But what I think would worry Pakistan is if you have that worst case scenario where the, the Taliban takes over by force and reinstitutes the theocracy that it had in the 1990s. I think that Pakistan would worry about that type of scenario in Afghanistan just because of the fear that that would empower or embolden uh, militants uh, across the border uh, in Pakistan. It could inspire some type of new insurgency, much like what you had with the Pakistani Taliban uh, some years ago. And that's the, obviously the last thing that anyone in, in Pakistan wants. But I think that all reasonable actors uh, would hope that somehow you can get a piece of political settlement that leads to uh, an arrangement in which the Taliban has a role in government, but it's balanced or counterbalanced by others uh, in that same government. And finally, Afghanistan, which has been a graveyard for superpowers. How do you see it rebuilding itself in future? Well, you know, if you look back at uh, the last few hundred years of history in Afghanistan, there was one period, a, a relatively uh, short period in the 20th century uh, when the there was no foreign presence or foreign influence in Afghanistan. That was a period in time when certainly there were problems in Afghanistan, but it did manage to, to advance and enjoy some stability, prosperity, uh, and of course that, uh, that, that would end uh, fairly soon once the Soviets um, started doing their thing, so to speak. So you know, I, I know that there's this view that maybe if, if, if all the foreign actors just went away and left, Af left Afghanistan alone, that at that point, yes, you could have some type of grand bargain that struck up by the Taliban and other, uh, other Afghan um, stakeholders. But I, I like to hope that that could be the case, but I, I really fear that the Taliban may not be willing to work from within the existing system in ways that many hope that, that it would be. So. I think that it, the, the notion of sort of Afghanistan on its own trying to rebuild the country and get things done, obviously that can only happen if there's a peace deal with the Taliban, which I don't expect. And you also have many new types of anti-state threats in Afghanistan that you didn't have you know, decades ago, such as uh, international terror groups like Islamic State, which are at, at their roots not Afghan, even if, they're, if, if they've got many Afghans that, um, that are fighting for them, these are foreign groups they have no interest in getting involved in the discussions of national reconstruction, national reconciliation in Afghanistan. And then, you know, you're always going to have the regional players that are going to do whatever they can to try to, um, to pursue their interests, uh, particularly if, if things are really looking bad on a security, uh, in a security context. So, you know, Iran, Russia, Pakistan, India, China, they're all going to do what they have to do to secure their interests. And that's when you have to worry about the risk of proxy war, particularly in terms between Af India and Pakistan. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's too bad. You wish it didn't have to be that way. But um, I imagine that we're far away from the period we we're in, you know, in those, uh, those, those salad days, so to speak, of the early 20th century when Afghanistan enjoyed that period of some, some um, stability and prosperity without interference from other countries. I don't think we're going to see those days return for quite some time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your time. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.